Hello and welcome to another episode of Blockchains Explained. My name is Cosmo and today we will be talking about Ethereum. And in my opinion, Ethereum is digital silver. Now, why is Ethereum digital silver when Bitcoin is digital gold? Well, the reason, the main reason why I believe, because there's a bunch of mixed opinions about this, why Ethereum is digital silver actually is that Ethereum is the first blockchain, the first blockchain to introduce smart contracts. So if Bitcoin actually was actually the first blockchain, which sparked all this craze about blockchain technology and how you can have these transactions that are settled by a, a blockchain, Ethereum is actually the first blockchain to introduce these smart contracts, which are basically self-executing contracts that uh, are being ran on the blockchain. So everything you know that you would have in a normal contract when you make a contract between a buyer and a seller or other types of contracts that you have all of these can be written as lines of code and executed on the blockchain so this basically creates uh, a lot of trust and security because the smart contract runs automatically on the blockchain right so if you have to transfer some amounts of money when action a is performed you know this will happen automatically on the blockchain when that action is performed you, there's no like you know third parties there's no like hey pay me pay me pay me the money's in, locked in the smart contract and like boom once the, the action is performed this is automatically converted right it's also very efficient and cost saving because it's very simple you know executed by the blockchain you know there's no humans necessarily in between except for the developer that writes the smart contract and it's also decentralized so like it, it runs on a blockchain that is decentralized is automated because like i said it runs on the blockchain it's interoperable so like you know there's multiple things that can fit into this and it's immutable record keeping this is actually very important for the again the blockchain itself where like hey, you cannot change the terms you cannot do this this and that you know all transactions are also transparent and mutable so this is actually very important and uh, smart contracts actually started having some some standards right like there are many types of smart contracts and anybody can run a type of smart contract but very fast you know people started making these standards right so for example an erc20 is a standard that you might be familiar with because it is like a fungible token right so it's the most basic standard and it's used to create interchangeable tokens so all of these tokens like usdc like wbtc like curve and like you know pepe and a bunch of these other tokens that are on the on on chain you know the, these coins that are called i mean token is different than coin but we'll talk about this later but basically all of these <clears throat> tokens that can be traded are erc20 token right now, besides ERC-20 token, there are two NFT standards. You might be familiar with an NFT. You know, it's a non-fungible token. 721 is actually the most popular NFT standard. And it's what a lot of these, you know, collections like CryptoPunks um, or like Board API Club, like you, they use back in the day. And there is also like an, another ERC-1155 token standard, which is like a, a multi-token standard. So, for example, imagine like, you know, Adidas has a pair of shoes in the metaverse where they're going to have like one pair of shoes but there's going to be like 10,000 different or like 10,000 copies of the same shoe right so you have the same pair of shoes that's being issued in like 10 different uh copies 10,000 different copies so 10,000 people can own one pair of these shoes or more um yeah one pe one person can own more, more copy of these shoes whereas like cryptopunks is a collection of like 10,000 different unique individual crypto punks in themselves right so these are kind of like the two ma main differences between the nrc721 and 1155 and all of these are standards now besides this there are a lot of other standards there are a lot of other standards because on a blockchain you can actually do many different kinds of operations there's many different kinds of uh, things that you can put inside of a smart contract uh, and for example like uh, erc4626 is a, a, a tokenized vault standard right so for example uh, this is used more in like a banking system right so let's say that like i have uh, my ethereum uh, my eth or like uh, i have my uh, like you know some other coins you know whether it's like usdc or, or whatever and i want to deposit them uh, in a contract that basically gives me yield right so like it's kind of like i'm putting my money in the bank like i don't want to use it now i just want to keep it there uh, and it's going to keep earning an interest so these uh standards are you know for like 4626 it's not something that you might know but if you use a platform like yarn you know which is a, a pretty good uh, you know yield offering platform so kind of like a pretty good bank and uh, you know if we extrapolate it 
uh, it's it's a platform you might want to consider. You might want to do some research on if you have like you know too much ETH standing around. You know if you have like too much USDC and you want to put it in a in a contract to receive yield. And like I said, there's a lot of other standards around this, right? And a lot of these things, basically, this this ability to create this code in a lot of these different ways, sparked this idea of decentralized applications which is software that basically runs on blockchain, right? So how traditionally, like you have normal apps, you know, uh, um, that, you know, function like from a data center. So like the, this application is run somewhere in the cloud, like we're saying. So there's a data center that basically runs the application and then you can view it on your phone via the app, right? In a decentralized or in a DApp ecosystem, basically these, these apps are run in a decentralized way. So they, they don't talk to one main source. They actually talk between each other in a decentralized network. Uh, and that's basically the, the, the level up from applications where like we don't need, you know, like, hey, a, a centralized server to run these applications. We don't answer to like, you know, a, a centralized company. There are actually these decentralized applications. Everybody kind of has a piece of it. Uh, of course, these pieces are, you know, like uh, redundant. So there's, you know, more phones, for example, that have the same type of data in order for it to be accessible at all times. Um, but anyway, uh, the the other thing is that uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is quite big, right? So these decentralized applications basically sparked a, a whole frenzy of, you know, creating these decentralized applications that have specific purposes, right? So we have like the DeFi ecosystem. The DeFi basically means decentralized finance. So we have a lot of protocols that do a lot of things, you know, everything from like, you know, decentralized exchanges to lending and borrowing platforms to a lot of different things that you can, that you can use for decentralized finance, uh, right? The same like, you know, traditional finance, like banks and apps and, you know, like loot or like, you know, whatever, or I don't know, European banks, you know, better their group Societe General or whatever banks you use. There's similar applications that are being run decentralized on the Ethereum network or inside of the Ethereum ecosystem, maybe not itself on the network itself, but on other, you know, connected, connected platforms. There is also a lot of like NFT platforms, you know, so we talked a lot about NFTs. NFTs were quite big in the last bull market, right? So there's platforms like OpenSea, like Rarible, like Super Rare. There is a lot of NFT platforms that like you might want to use. There is also centralized exchanges. So the centralized exchanges don't particularly like ran on the blockchain, but they easily talk to the blockchain, right? So that's usually how most people start putting money into the blockchain is through a centralized exchange like Hobby or Binance or, uh, you know, Bybit or KuCoin or whatever these other centralized exchanges you might be familiar with. Coinbase is a big one, like in America, you know, FTX used to be one, but we're not talking about that right now. And there's a lot of other, you know, uh, analytic tools, for example, like CoinGecko or like Etherscan, you know, which is where you go to see all of the transactions that are being made and where, you know, there's a lot of analytics that are being done for the chain itself. You know, there is infrastructure. So for example, something like MetaMask that you might want to use uh, in order to communicate with the blockchain, in order to sign these transactions, in order to make these transactions and so on. There's scaling options, there's auditors, there's like you know, event platforms, there's you know, a lot of corporations that are coming now into the ecosystem and so on. So there's a lot, a lot of different applications that are being ran inside of the, the Ethereum ecosystem. And this makes it amazing. This actually makes it amazing because all of these applications that are run on chain use this thing that is called gas, right? So imagine this, in order to run your car or to run your motorcycle or to run like whatever you, you, you know, thing you're using to move from one place to another, you're using gas, right? You're using some petrol and it's the same with the Ethereum network. Every time you want to make a transaction, every time you want to, to run an application on the blockchain, you use something that is called gas, you know, traditionally it's called gas for the same principle that, hey, I pay to move this money from place A to point B or I pay to run this application from point A to point B. You can view it as like, you know, maybe electricity cost when you're running your computer. So yeah, gas is actually very important because because the more applications we run, the more gas we have to pay. And all of this gas is basically paid in ETH, which ETH, which is the, the, the native token for the Ethereum blockchain. So ETH is the native token for the Ethereum blockchain. And, you know, this implies another or like a, a very big usability for ETH, right? Which 
like gold, you know, like, hey, we mainly have it in the vault and stuff like that. But with silver, we can actually like make a lot of things, right? So there's like, you know, silver chains, there's like silver earrings, there's like, you know, a silverware. That's why it's actually called, you know, like all this cutlery, right? Like spoons, forks, knives. It used to be called silverware because it used to be made out of silver. You can use it for plates. You can use it for like a lot of other varieties and a lot of other options to use this precious metal that basically brings up the price because there is more demand there is more demand for ETH on the network because all of these transactions are basically ran by ETH, which is very important uh, as the, the primary use case for ETH. You know, it is to to run the, the chain. And this is actually sparked, you know, we can we can view here the Ethereum price. This is actually sparked uh, a very big usability in the last bull market because Ethereum was a very used network. So like Ethereum, uh, you know, was the the chain. To, to trade NFTs on, for example, in the last bull market. And gas fees for NFTs were phenomenally high. So I remember, you know, like if you wanted to trade an NFT like you or to buy or to sell or to mint an NFT, you basically had to pay something like, you know, $200, even $400. Sometimes it was $60, but depending on the gas price, you know, because gas price fluctuates depending on the, 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 like how many people are on the network, how many people need this gas right now, how many people need to run their transaction right now. And sometimes like it would be like these massive, these massive numbers, these massive prices for gas. And this has helped immensely to spark the Ethereum price to go even higher. Of course, we were at the peak of the bull market and Ethereum was actually like, that's when it kind of started to become silver, right? That's when it started to become silver because it was just used massively for all of these decentralized applications that are running on the network. And ever since, you know, like it trailed a bit, like there have been some, some people, you know, that they said that, hey, Ethereum is not actually the best. And yet another thing that basically happened because of these massive prices is that, you know, Traditionally, Ethereum used to be like a proof of work mechanism, right? So kind of like Bitcoin, you know, was mining. So a mining capacity depends on the computational power. And there, there was a lot of electricity demand, a lot of electricity output in order to run these massive computers, these massive data centers with these massive computations. And this sparked, you know, like a whole anti-Ethereum thing that like, oh my God, you know, like you're using all this electricity and there's other options out there to make it more... Um, energy efficient to make it more green uh you know so they actually switched to like a proof of stake mechanism a couple of years ago they actually switched to a proof of stake which basically means that you know the validating capacity depends on the stake of the network so what actually happens is that you know people will stake their money so they'll, they'll put it like hey i'm not using this ETH. i want to secure the network by keeping this money for sure secured in the vault and then like i basically earn rewards uh by you know maintaining the security of the network which is like intrinsically it's like a, a vastly different way than proof of work and proof of stake, right? So it's not like miners that are securing the network. It's people that are holding their bags, that are holding the money, that are securing the network. And there, there is, of course, some computational done, but we don't need these massive computers to run these massively expensive algorithms in order to mint the next block. We just need a few computers that are basically making sure that, hey, these transactions are valid because of all of these people that are staking their ETH, right? Because of all of these, th this money that is actually like uh, held in the same place. So yeah, you can look more into this. I'm not going to go super deep into it. The idea is that, you know, people thought that, hey, gas prices were actually going to go way down where we're going to switch to proof of stake because of other proof of stake blockchains, you know, like they have like gas fees that are basically like, you know, 0 0.001 cents or, or dollars, you know, so like they're like pennies on the dollar, especially compared to the X to, to, to the last prices of Ethereum and of Ethereum gas fees. But this didn't necessarily actually happen because of other reasons that we're not going to go back. That was not the point. The point of this switch was to be like 99.8% more energy efficient. So by switching from proof of work to proof of stake, they made the network 99.8% more energy efficient, you know? And Ethereum, the, the other reason why basically people said that, hey, uh, they're not so bullish on Ethereum and that, you know, they're more bearish on Ethereum is because of this thing that is basically called an EVM compatible network. So Ethereum basically invented the, the, the smart contract because uh, there is this code, you know, like Solidity code that basically runs on blockchain. But how does it run through on blockchain? It basically runs through an Ethereum compiler, right? We're not going to get into, into computer science here, but, you know, traditionally you have, uh, you know, traditional, traditional pro, uh, coding languages like JavaScript, like Java, like C++, 
um, like you know all of these other uh, programming languages that are running our computers right now and they need a compiler now this compiler is basically something that is ran on chain well not on chain is basically run on an ethereum virtual machine right so the ethereum virtual machine is the the uh, the thing that is basically running on chain and turns out that these ethereum virtual machines like can be ran on other blockchains right so they invented the ethereum virtual machine and then there's all of these other evm ethereal virtual machine evm compatible chains that's part from this that are using the same principle like hey we can run the same code uh it's just like you know cheaper or faster or like whatever because our network handles these transactions in different ways than the ethereum chain would do it and this actually, you know, like uh, created the uh, you know, very used, very used blockchains, like, you know, the Binance Smart Chain, like the Avalanche uh, Chain, you know, like the Polygon and like a lot of these other blockchains that we basically see here. Uh, and people, a lot of people started to, to go towards these uh, because it was much cheaper, you know, because it was much cheaper uh, to secure these networks, right, to, 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 to make these transactions. You know, we're talking from like hundreds of dollars. Uh, to like you know pain so that's I uh, you know thousand percent cheaper uh, to run these transactions now right now at this time the ethereum uh, you know, in order to settle a transaction on ethereum is like you know a few dollars uh, so it's not you know hundreds of dollars it's a few dollars uh, which is still like more expensive than these chains but the idea is that actually ethereum is the oldest chain and they're like you know right like right now if you want to be considered uh, like a serious project especially when you're talking about stuff like real world assets so real world assets is something like hey uh, i want to put my house i want to put my car i want to put you know these like uh, like real world assets on chain well uh, most of these companies that are doing this they're doing it on ethereum because it is considered kind of like the 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 standard you know people that are trading millions of dollars worth of real estate they don't care about you know 200 dollars in the transaction fee they care more that the network is secured and actually a lot of these networks because of their uh, because it's so cheap bots can just run a lot of transactions you know so like it's much easier for much cheaper for bots uh, to run these transactions now the network is still secure um, but you know if somebody wants to wants to do you wrong it might be easier on these chains than Ethereum. Don't take my word for it, but just something to keep in mind, you know? And of course, uh, Ethereum is actually like uh, considered also by the, the traditional market right now, by the traditional investors, it is considered uh, 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 the best second option after Bitcoin when entering in the blockchain space. That's why they actually launched the ETF, right? It's the second largest coin by market cap it is the, the coin that has like all of these use cases for it so whether like you know bitcoin you just hold it as gold for ethereum where it's like hey it's the the network where you're basically running all of these transactions or all of these transactions are possible it is the place where uh, there are a lot more opportunities for using blockchain technology blockchain technology to run your applications so um, there's many reasons behind it but that's actually why i still consider ethereum to be like uh, silver I still consider Ethereum to be uh, like silver. So uh, yeah, this is no financial advice. Please, uh, you know, do your own research when you're making investments into all of these things. There is a lot more to talk about here. I just scratched the surface on like, hey, what Ethereum actually is and how it can be used, uh, you know, to, towards what purposes and why you might want to look into Ethereum. Uh, but now it's time to, to do your own research. Or if you want to talk about it, uh, you know, join our Telegram group. Uh, you know, comment a question down below if you have questions, if, if you would want me to do another video about something else. Uh, thank you for watching. Like, share, and subscribe. We're going to continue to pull out these videos for you. There's some more playful alternative on, you know, the traditional kind of video. It's I'm sharing from my experience. I'm sharing from my vision. And this is something that I grew to understand in over, you know, like uh, eight years since I've been in the six seven six to seven years since i've been in crypto right now uh and yeah i'll see you in the community drop a like drop a comment and subscribe i will see you in the next one peace and happy trading